Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Yasmina Greco. I'm with O'Reilly Media, and I will be your host for today's webcast. Today we have J. Todd Featherling presenting Healthcare 101, Cradle to Grave. Mr. Featherling serves as chairman and founder of Stratazon. Stratazon provides advanced analytics in the cloud to hospitals, physicians, pharmaceuticals, public health, and ancillary healthcare providers. I will turn the program over to Todd in just a moment, but first I'd like to go over some housekeeping things to help you get the most out of today's webcast. You'll want to open the group chat widget if you haven't already done so. This is where we can interact with each other during the event and where you can submit your questions for Todd. We find that our audience usually has a lot of good knowledge to share, so we encourage you to chat freely during the event. However, if you have questions for Todd, please preface them with a capital letter Q so we know that it's for him and we can make sure he sees it for Q&A. You can also open, move, and resize any of the other widgets. If you'd like to tweet from the Twitter widget today, you may need to give it permission to access your account. Our hashtag today is StratarX, all one word, and the Twitter widget will automatically append it to your tweets so you don't have to. If you have any problems during the event, please take a look at the help widget. If you continue to have problems, please post it in the chat room and one of our staff will help you right away. For choppy audio or stalled visuals, please try refreshing your window. And remember, the best thing you can do for a good audio stream is close any apps that could interfere. People always ask, so we'd like you to know, we are recording today's webcast and we'll have an archive ready usually within 48 hours. And folks, at this time, it is my pleasure to turn the program over to Todd for his presentation. Hello, Todd. Hello. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. We're very excited to be here today with O'Reilly. Uh, this is the first time that we've done this presentation as a webcast. Typically, we will do it interactively on a whiteboard. So what we are going to do is, while I am talking, uh, we have Ms. Carrie Allen, who is a uh, doodler, part-time and full-time statistician in our healthcare services area, who will be drawing alongside the information that we are presenting. So from time to time, I will flip back and forth, and we will have some live video stream as well. At the end of the presentation, we will capture an image of uh, the complete healthcare 101 and make that available as well at the end of the presentation. So once again, very excited to be here. This topic, Healthcare 101, Cradle to Grave, is a very complicated subject, healthcare is in general. And what I am going to attempt to do today will be to simplify that and at the same time give you a tremendous amount of new information uh, to help you uh, understand healthcare better. So when we talk about cradle to grave, uh, we always begin on the birth side. Healthcare, if you can uh, think about it in this way, is really a hockey stick. It starts uh, with our first days on the earth and ends as we leave the earth. So those are two of our most expensive days. And if you can imagine uh, from age zero to one, your healthcare expenses drop pretty dramatically and are flat up until your 20s. And then there's a little bump in our 20s and now into our 30s and even some 40s for uh, birth and uh, OB services. Then it begins to really pick up and spike as we approach 50 all the way through age 85 plus. And that's why we call it the hockey stick uh, life cycle of a person on the expenditure side. So let's dig in a little bit deeper into the birth side. So one of the uh, numbers that may be surprising to you is that in the United States, we have approximately 3.99 million births per year. That is a rate of 13 per 1,000 population. The fertility rate in the United States is currently running at about 64.1 births 
per 1,000 women age, 55, uh, age 15 to 44 years of, of age. The percent born of low birth weight, you will be surprised to learn, is about 8.1%. This is a very important number to know as you begin to understand health care because those that are born preterm, about 12%, are in this low birth weight category. Their average expenditure is approximately $50,000 versus a normal newborn, which is about 5000 so as we start to think about ways that we can save money in healthcare and deliver a more efficient healthcare system, these are one of those areas that can be completely prevented through proper prenatal care and especially folic acid. The state of Virginia has recently introduced a folic acid uh, program through prenatal vitamins and they've had a dramatic decrease in the number of preborn, or sorry, preterm pre-births. So that is one solution that is out there that only costs pennies per day uh, instead of 45,000 additional dollars in expenditure. Of all births, the percent unmarried is about 41%, and the mean age currently at first birth is about 25.4. As you might imagine, this number has been growing over the last couple of uh, decades. Uh, it used to be around 19 uh, as early as the 80s. So we are seeing a pretty dramatic increase in the average age as, um, as they grow. So as I mentioned before, births are basically at flat and declining slightly. One of the areas of greatest concern for me uh, looking at the demographics of our country is the decline in population among the 15 to 19 year olds and the 20 to 24 year olds. These are our early workers that are coming into the workforce and with the declining number of population in those areas, we do expect to see increasing wage pressures as well as available workforces. I know in particular in Nashville and in Silicon Valley today, there are thousands of technology jobs that are open. And this is partly uh, to explain that, that current uh, issue that we have there. As we look out to the right of the graph, we begin to see that the 35 to 44 population starts declining. Uh, also in the 45 to 54, and this is looking at from 2011 to 2016. This data comes from the latest ESRI, Demographics and Population. So until we get to now 65 to 74, that is where we're seeing the uh, dramatic increases in the baby boomer population. What's a particular note of interest, and I'll follow up with a couple of key points in a few minutes, is that 75 to 84, as well as the 85 plus categories, are actually flat. So many people have been projecting that we will see a dramatic increase in the amount of inpatient admissions and other healthcare services. Well, that actually has not occurred, and that is part of the reason. We do anticipate it occurring when the 65 to 74 age segment moves out uh, another five to 10 years. So we're not quite there to the boom times that we're expecting, but they are right around the corner and definitely represent a very interesting opportunity from a healthcare services perspective. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing for one second, go back to our slideshow. All right. And um, here uh, what we have is um, a couple of major trends that we see that are occurring. And I'm going to put it in context to a little bit of history. So in 1928, uh, what we saw was a doctor's visit was equivalent to the cost of a chicken or a rooster. I know that sounds kind of funny, but uh, that is uh, how we paid for things uh, back in that time frame. And then if you had to do a hospital stay, that might cost you about five chickens. Um, in 1929, Blue Cross came out uh, with the first insurance plan, and it was $6 for a year to cover you in case you needed hospital care. And that is really at the tipping point of when the healthcare system changed from a traditional consumer model to now a payer-based model. 
1939, Blue Shield came out uh, for the uh, first insurance plan for California lumberjacks. And this was really designed because this, at the time, was the most dangerous occupation in the country. And there were a lot of uh, widows and children that were created out of this industry. And this insurance plan was designed to help them meet their needs. Come 1969, we had an entire new face of the American physician, Dr. Marcus Welby. Uh, and so for the first time, the physician was really glamorized on the big screen from a television perspective and really changed how we saw our physician. In those days, we had a lot of uh, home-based care, but that was with a physician making house calls. It is kind of interesting to note that we have new business models in the country today that now represent house calls being done again. In 1982, we're going to spend a lot more time today on coding, but in 1982 is when the first DRGs were introduced, and they were really introduced as a way to manage costs. DRGs stand for Diagnostic Related Groupings. We're going to spend a whole section on coding in a few minutes, but this is really the first step uh, that we took as a country in order to begin to define healthcare where the costs are going, and this eventually led to uh, major advances in how we define healthcare service lines. In 2005, fast forward a little bit, we have dramatic changes in how physicians are now employed. Uh, we've gone through several different iterations of the physician models, everything from purchasing practices outright. Uh, which didn't go too well for a lot of people who uh, overpaid for those practices, to uh, employment, to different versions of employment. And today, this model has become predominant. Some markets are as high as 50 percent uh, employment by hospitals today of these physician practices. In addition to the hospital-based employment model, there are also subspecialty groups today that are beginning to aggregate these practices. We'll spend a lot more time talking about healthcare reform, ACOs, and other mechanisms towards the end of the presentation. Um, but as we see the continued pressure on cost and profit profitability, this is one of the major areas uh, for anyone wanting to understand healthcare going forward, uh, where, where the dollars are and how the changing care model uh, will prove to be uh, profitability for the coming generation. In 2012, our current year, we are introducing now a completely new paradigm shift, and we'll go through this uh, later in the presentation as well. But now we're focused a lot more on population health management. So not only do I have to be concerned with treating the patients who walk in my door through the ER, through our outpatient clinics, through hospital services and physician clinics, now I also have to make sure that the entire community is healthy and making progress from a community health perspective. We've introduced now the accountable care organizations. We have several pilots that are up, and that program is continuing to expand. We will look at that program in more detail in a few minutes. We're also talking a lot more in healthcare now about full capitation. This is really risk-based pricing, where the hospital will now uh, begin to take care of an entire community or parts of a community and go at risk for that pricing, a very different model for healthcare than what we've had in the past. Um, in addition, we now have a whole new coding schema that will be rolled out in 2014. It's been delayed a little bit over the last two years as we move through this reform. But ICD-10s have a dramatic opportunity to both complicate and uh, create a worldwide standard all at the same time. So that will be very interesting to watch, and we'll spend a few more min minutes on it in our uh, coding section in just a few. Okay. One of the things that uh, I'd like to point out specifically are a few areas that we see that are changing in healthcare today. One of those areas are inpatient admissions. In 2011, we saw a decline of about 3.3% in the data that we are analyzing. Everyone thought that that number was going up, not down. 
And so for those people who have been modeling out health care, uh, that, that came as a big surprise. Outpatient visits, although they are growing because of some of this is changing where care is delivered from an inpatient to an outpatient setting, it's not growing fast enough to account for the difference of the 3.3% that we saw over the uh, last couple of years. So care management is changing. And what I mean by care management is how uh, the physician will go about taking care of a individual's needs depending on uh, both pharmaceutical uh, devices as well as therapy, taking all of those three areas into account as they move through the healthcare system. What has traditionally happened is, let's say I fall and hurt my knee, I might go directly to an orthopedic specialist and bypass my primary care physician altogether. In the new care models that we see, we're going back to more of a quarterback type of approach by those physicians in order to make sure that everyone in the community is getting the appropriate level of care at the appropriate site. And even within the different sites, we're seeing more streamlined processing, uh, less overnight stays, and a whole new way of thinking about how to uh, meet the needs of the patients from a more holistic perspective, whether it's from surgery to home with home-based care and moving from a seven-day length of stay to a three-day length of stay. That will have a big impact on cost going forward as well. As we also talked about in the previous slide, the hospitals, the physicians now have to change their orientation to care more for the community, and we'll uh, discuss that a little bit more when we get to the accountable care organizations. These are some national inpatient trends that we are tracking, and what we're looking at here is uh, population growth on the bottom scale, and then the change in the number of admissions on the left-hand scale. So what you can quickly see is that all regions of the country are actually going down. Some are going down faster than others. And that represents opportunities for those people who are rolling out new products across the country to uh, geographically segment which areas that you're gonna go into. The next slide talks more about specifics from a discharge uh, perspective by payer. So once again, we are seeing some pretty dramatic changes in uh, how care is delivered by different types of payers. And so as you can see, Medicare and Medicaid uh, are probably representative now of greater than 50% of all inpatient admissions across the country. That number in and of itself uh, causes us all to stop and think about uh, reform from a federal government and state government perspective. Service line growth opportunities, um, once again, with overall admissions going down, one of the things that you want to pay close attention to in trying to understand health care are where areas are back on the increase. For instance, many people uh, believe that cardiology and cancers are growing fairly dramatically, when in fact from an inpatient admission perspective, they're actually declining. They do represent both number one and number two leading causes of death in our country still. But from a overall care administration's perspective, those numbers are actually on the decline. One of the other areas that we've been tracking for some time is the area of gastro. This we typically refer to as the Pepsi generation instead of the Pepsi generation for all of those that uh, lived through the 80s and 90s. Remember those commercials? But we have, uh, as a country, been putting so much stuff into our stomachs, both from a food perspective, but also from heartburn and other types of over-the-counter drugs that we are now seeing some maladies that will come out of this uh, service line growth that will be um, pretty significant. In addition, uh, connective tissues, orthopedics, all of this area is growing rapidly, and part of that is due to that aging population. Uh, as they move into the 55 to 65 age categories, we are going to see an increase in the number of people that will need to have knee, hip, joint replacements as well as shoulders and other parts. 
So that will be an area that really will warrant close uh, representation. There's one area that's a little bit hidden behind the light blue dot, and that's the area of behavioral health, another area that we see growing pretty dramatically as far as a product line. And for those of you trying to understand healthcare from an industry perspective, behavioral health still represents the largest share of what I'll call mom and pop organizations. These are very small uh, types of homegrown businesses where they've started uh, with pretty small facilities and there has been very little consolidation, although growing, in this particular service line. So those are where I would focus time on it if you are going to look at uh, specific uh, disease information. Okay? So we've covered sort of where the population is going, and we've covered what kinds of diseases are in the population. What I'd like to do now is switch over and begin to talk about how that care is delivered. So first of all, when we start talking about the continuum of care, in particular we're looking at uh, first and foremost where the most dollars are spent, which is in hospitalizations. In the country today, in 2011, we would expect to see about 40,692,505 inpatient admissions. And so that's a rate of roughly 13%. If you can think about it from a healthcare perspective and hospitalization, you might only go to the hospital about one time every seven years, given the current um, uh, population stratification that we talked about earlier. So if you are marketing to consumers via an inpatient, you have very little likelihood of having uh, repeat visits from the same person. Uh, so that is one thing that as you start to understand how healthcare works and what services, it's not a day-to-day -day interaction like a grocery store. It is a year-to-year -year type of interaction. Outpatient services are a little less, uh, so uh, a little less frequent, uh, and that is about 96 million visits that will occur in an outpatient setting. So this can be at the hospital. It could be in an ambulatory surgery center or an imaging center. We've had a dramatic increase in the number of freestanding surgery and imaging centers over the last 20 years. In fact, the majority of those services are now delivered on those sites. The hospitals themselves continue to be a major player as well in the outpatient setting. The next area that I think is also going through a fairly dramatic change is in the area of emergency rooms. And here we would expect to see about 136 million visits to the emergency room over the next year. And that's a rate of about 43% of the U.S. population, almost half now, are going to have some form of interaction in the emergency department. Where this is really changing is in the area of urgent care and now even freestanding emergency departments. This particular area of care uh, has the potential to uh, really become a lot more efficient by driving the care to the appropriate site based on the level of care that is being delivered. If you go into an emergency room today because you have a cough, which by the way is the number one reason for emergency room visits, upper respiratory infections, then there are a lot of those cases that are really at the wrong site. They should be delivered either at the physician office visit or at another location like an urgent care or a freestanding emergency department where we could deliver that care at a far lower cost than what we have to uh, staff up in order to effectively deliver trauma services through an emergency department. The last area are physician office visits, and yes, that number is correct. There are over a billion physician office visits across the United States in 2011, and so the rate here is about 3.3. So uh, not sure how many of you uh, fit into the average here. Uh, I'm lucky if I do maybe one office visit every two years, but on average in the United States, we'll have about 3.3 physician office visits per year. So that would include everything from family practice physicians to specialists as well as pediatricians. So those are some of the numbers that we're trying to deal with. All of these numbers are going to become very important as we continue to move through 
the healthcare system. Each one of these numbers represents a transaction from a technology perspective. So in order to have a hospitalization, lots of different things have to be captured and we're gonna spend uh, quite a bit of time talking about from an information technology perspective, how that patient moves through the continuum, how do we code for those patients? And by code, I don't mean uh, Ruby or Rails or Java or Python. I'm talking about healthcare coding, and we'll spend some time trying to explain what that means and how to track these patients. So the, the real key takeaway in where we're leading to is how to track the dollars, where the money is going in the healthcare industry. Okay, uh, next is disease profiling, and this is also an area that we spend a lot of time trying to understand um, down to a very uh, geographic, finite area of geography as well as the United States as a whole of where different diseases are going. So we saw the chart a few minutes ago with the bubbles, and then I thought I would break those down into some specific numbers because I, I, I presume that several folks that are on the call today are interested in different service lines. So at the top, as I said, uh, circulatory, uh, is one of the uh, leading areas for inpatient admissions, and then that is followed by pregnancy and then followed by respiratory. Respiratory is one of those areas that continues to grow uh, from a overall uh, healthcare perspective. That's followed by the muscular skeleton system, the digestive system, the nervous system, and we're still at about 2.3 million visits on the inpatient admission side um, at that point of the nervous system. And then as I mentioned before, uh, these are categories called MDCs, major diagnostic categories, and we'll explain a little bit more about MDCs when we get to the coding section. But in the mental and behavioral area, we're still at about 1.6 million uh, inpatient admissions for that particular area. Those inpatient admissions do tend to be much higher as far as a length of stay that they would uh, that those patients would stay in the hospital. The more interesting thing also is if we moved all the way to the bottom of the list of major diagnostic categories, we would see two areas. One is multiple significant trauma with about 44,000 inpatient admissions a year and burns with about 23,000. Even though those are the two smallest, they represent disproportionately the highest average cost that will occur in a particular market. So that is one of those areas that you also want to pay close attention to as you begin to understand how service lines might, might play into different economic models in healthcare. Speaking of models in healthcare, this is uh, probably, for me, one of the scariest charts that I've ever seen around healthcare expenditure data. And what we see here is the actual numbers from 2004 through 2010, and then 2011 through 2019 are projected national healthcare expenditures. So where we are sitting right now today, we believe we're at about $2.7, $2.8 trillion for healthcare. It represents over uh, 17% of the GDP today. The scary part is that it's going to about 4.6 trillion by 2020, or 19.8% of the GDP. So if, if we get up around 20% of the GDP just for healthcare, that is a very um, tough model to sustain long term. And that is why we're having so much discussion, not only around uh, this presidential election, but in Washington and state capitals all across the country to try to figure out how to reduce healthcare expenditure. The last time we had a reduction in the growth rate of healthcare expenditures was in 1997. So there'll be bonus points at the end of the presentation if anybody can tell me what was going on in 1997. The growth rate in the last year alone was about 4%. So one of the things that uh, has never made sense to me, and, and probably likewise to many of the people on the uh, presentation today, is why am I getting 18, 15, 18% increases in my employer-sponsored health care 
when the overall rate is going at about 4%. Unfortunately, I don't have a good answer for you. So uh, if anybody else does, I'd love to hear uh, your rationalization for why that uh, is occurring. But it's because of those increases that are driving up the overall cost. And if you do go back to layers of the onion, there is some logical explanation as far as the expenditures that we have to have on new technology, especially new imaging, uh, new devices, medical devices that are coming out to help prolong the quality of life. So there is some rationale uh, for that 4% increase, um, but overall, uh, health insurance in general has been a faster growing expenditure than the total national health expenditures overall. To provide you with a little bit more detail on this particular area, we have our U.S. healthcare expenditure data, and in here you do see the individual breakouts that I've provided to you for 2011. And so you can see that there was $827 billion that were spent on hospital care in the past year and $556 billion that were spent in physicians. In addition, we've provided you with some details around dental services, other nursing home and home health, so that you could see how the pie is truly broken down. You'll also notice in the red chart on the right, twice, the prescription drug amount, uh, a pretty significant amount of expenditures that are occurring in just the pharmaceutical area of care. One of the other things, if you are thinking about uh, health care and how it's broken down today, I thought some of these numbers might also be beneficial to you. So in our uh, country today, in the United States, we have 5,754 hospitals that are quote unquote licensed by the American Hospital Association. Of those in the community sector, there are 4,985. In that 5,754, the hospitals that would not be included would be those uh, types of government-owned facilities that would not be included in that. One of the other areas of interest would be the investor-owned or for-profit hospitals, and there are about 1,013 of those. Um, just as recently as last night, I was having a conversation with a colleague who predicted this number was going to go closer to 80% over the next five years because of health care reform. I actually had to disagree with him. Uh, we're now at about basically one to one out of every six that are investor owned. I do think that number might grow to around 2,000 over the next 20 years, uh, but it's a much slower rate. And part of the rationale behind that is that uh, in, among the investor owned community, there is a significant amount of cash that is available today for acquisitions, but even a small community hospital, 200, 250-bed hospital, is going to be a 450 to $600 million operation. And so it does take a tremendous amount of cash, and if you just extrapolate the numbers out for the country for us to get to greater than 50% investor-owned, the amount of capital that would be required to do that is, is just astronomical. Underneath hospitals, another important component are the number of hospital beds. And so today we have almost a million hospital beds in the country. However, only about 800,000 are staff. That becomes a very important number for any statistics that you try to do either per hospital or per hospital bed. It's very important to make sure you're looking at the number of operating beds that are actually in service. Many hospitals, especially those in an area called a certificate of need, uh, will be restricted on the number of beds in a particular community. Let's spend just a minute talking about certificate of need. What certificate of need is, is when a state licenses how many of a different health component can be delivered to a given geographical area. And so there are regulations that will prohibit different states uh, and the hospital and physician operators in those states from opening up a new clinic, a new hospital, a new outpatient surgery center without approval from the Certificate of Need Board. Tennessee is one of those states. And so there are some additional regulations in Certificate of Need states that you should be aware of 
that are not a um, uh, not at play in other states. Texas being one of those. In Texas, you can pretty much build whatever you want, uh, whenever you want, and however you want. Uh, so uh, very different as you move across the country, state by state, as far as regulations are concerned as well. We can do a whole uh, session just on that alone. In the physician segment, we're going to spend a little bit more time talking about physicians because I think it's a, a very interesting area as we talk about the primary care physicians becoming quarterbacks of the healthcare system. What are really under the numbers? So today's world, we have about 985,000 physicians according to the AMA. However, only about 752,000 of those physicians are actually directly involved in patient care and active today. So uh, we have a need for physicians all across the country. In addition, there is another phenomenon that is going on in our urban centers where we are over physician today. We have too many physicians in our urban markets and not enough physicians into our rural and into our suburban communities. So there has to be a redistribution of physicians at some point. And currently the federal government does provide some incentives for those rural communities so that reimbursements would be higher as you try to attract physicians to those particular areas. We'll also talk about physician need in a little more detail in a few slides as well. From a pharmaceutical perspective, there are about 10 major pharmaceutical companies worldwide that uh, supply us with the majority of our uh, drugs. In addition, there are about another uh, 215 that are kind of smaller mid-tier pharmaceutical companies as well. But all of these represent tremendous opportunities as they bring new drugs, new therapies, and new researches into the market. One of the other things that you might think about is how would you rate a hospital? So there are operational components that we use to rate hospitals as far as charges are concerned, average length of stay, you will hear that, number, that term quite a bit in healthcare, charges per day, revenue per day, beds. And so these are all different components that we look at when we're looking at key performance indicators of either hospitals, physicians, surgery centers, um, even, even down into the pharmaceutical area of healthcare. When you talk about hospital beds before, another way to uh, look at this and project back to the United States is the population uh, over that bed count. And so as you can see in the United States, uh, roughly uh, two-tenths of one percent uh, is the ratio that we see. But in Orlando, for instance, we're a little overbedded in the Orlando market uh, because we're slightly higher than the United States as a whole. Now, to their credit in Orlando, they have a tremendous amount of visitors to Disney World every year. And so that has to be factored in, as well as all of the counties in and surrounding Orlando who feed patients into that particular community. We use them as a case study for an accountable care uh, population management strategy that we recently presented, and I'll be sharing some of those data points with you in just a few minutes as well. In the area of physician need, uh, this has largely been regulated by some of the laws uh, called Starks, uh, Representative Starks uh, created a lot of this early methodology. And there are several different models that you can use to look at physician needs. The most prevalent study that's ever been done in the area was done in 1986 by Geminac. And that looked at all of the graduates uh, that were coming into the market and the need that existed for those graduates. In addition to Geminac, we also have the AMA, the American, uh, American Medical Association, and for that we use the current counts, 2012, uh, for that population uh, projection. And then there are a couple of other models in the physician need of which I think will become more relevant to us. Uh, one is a traditional HMO model. These are uh, areas like Kaiser in California, as well as Geisinger up in Pennsylvania, the Loveless Clinic in Albuquerque, who have had a closed model HMO for some time and really understand how to deliver care to an entire population as opposed to just the patients who walk in the door. The last area is really the uh, Kaiser model, uh, which is the primary care physician playing the quarterback of the care continuum. And that 
particular model, you have far less need of those primary care physicians as more and more of the specialty population grows. So uh, you can use a couple of different ways to actually get to both the demand and supply in this particular case. So what I've done is uh, provided you with two models so you can have some frame of reference here as far as the supply and demand for these different uh, specialty areas, primary care versus medicine, psych, surgery, and hospital-based. Uh, one of the areas that is growing rapidly is the area of hospitalists, and this is also causing a complete change in how care is delivered. It also causes problems within data, and we'll spend some more time talking about different data sources that are available in healthcare and how that will impact, but traditionally, in all of our data sets, we had referring physicians. These were typically those primary care physicians, and we could look at the relationship of which primary care physicians were referring to which specialist. What's happened is now that uh, the hospitalist is becoming the primary care physician or the attending physician at the particular hospital, a lot of that referring data is actually getting missed. That is also a huge business opportunity for anyone who is wanting to uh, understand how to track the flow of patients and how to manage it. It will become critically important as we move into um, this primary care driven model as opposed to our traditional uh, specialist oriented market. As you can see, uh, part of my comments bear out in the Orlando model below uh, where we have about almost 300 uh, primary care physicians more than we need and a lot more medical specialists. Once again, this was driven off of Orange County and in particular Orlando, both Florida Hospital and Orlando Regional Medical Center as well as all Palmer Women and Children's Hospital all take care of a much broader geographical region which has to be uh, pulled into your data as well. Now one area where Orlando is weak is in the area of behavioral health or psychiatry. So that area could see some growth. As we continue to drill down into the real physician story, we see that in the country we have 985,000 total licensed physicians, but only that 752,000 are patient care focused. So out of that number, out of the 985, you have to pull out all of the inactives. These are the physicians that are semi-retired or completely retired, uh, yet still maintaining an active medical license whether it is to treat the, their family members or if they're doing some part-time work. There's another 64,000 physicians, believe it or not, in the United States that are not classified. This data comes from the American Medical Association and is updated annually. Another 9,400 are unspecified physician specialties, and uh, the one that I love the most is address unknown. So there are 432 physicians just roaming around the country looking for uh, something to do. So uh, let me know if you find any of those. I've got a few markets that uh, could use uh, some physician help. All right, so as I promised earlier, we are going to talk uh, about transactions, and I think to really understand healthcare and how it works, you really have to understand how to track those transactions through the healthcare system and also you have to understand coding. If you can get your arms around those two areas, then number one, the opportunities that you see in the market will be multiplied because it's within those two areas that we are seeing serious innovation that is occurring in healthcare, both in Nashville but across the country as well. So uh, I'm going to start talking about the uh, three different areas that I see from a technology perspective that we feel like has to come together in order for us to get healthcare under control. And those areas are first and foremost the personal health record. These are my individual records, my day-to-day -day, uh, weight, could be my blood pressure, my glucose monitoring, all of the little components, even my exercise and wellness, uh, could be included in what I call a personal health record. So uh, go back two or three years ago, and we had Google and Microsoft really fighting for the space. Uh, Google has now exited the space, and so most of those records uh, fell over into the Microsoft Health Vault. Uh, 
which is a very interesting project and also one uh, worth uh, exploring further if you have not uh, visited their website lately. I would highly encourage you to. But we believe it all begins with that personal health record. And very few of us in the country, very few, probably less than 1 or 2 percent, are truly tracking our health records the way that we should, myself included. The next area would be what I call is the electronic health record. And this would be more of a community-oriented record. Uh, some might also call this a health information exchange, a RIO, regional health information operation. And then the last area is the electronic medical record. And these are the true clinical financial systems that are deployed today at hospitals, physician offices, home health, nursing homes, all across the country. So we're going to spend a little bit of time really uh, interacting on these particular areas because I believe that they are so critical and to understand how data would flow through these three areas is critical to understanding the future of healthcare. So in an ideal vision where we see the world headed is to that electronic health record and that would be fed from the EMR. So when you go to the hospital or when you go to the physician office for care, they would supplement that main record back to you. And so you would have a complete capture of everything that happened to you while you were in those particular care locations. In the system area underneath there, I wanted to give you guys some names to uh, begin to get familiar with as you start to uh, think about how you might interact with uh, hospitals in this particular case. So the main software vendors in the hospital world are Meditech, HMS here in Nashville, Cerner out of Kansas City, Meditech's out of Boston, uh, Epic, which is out of Madison, Wisconsin. Epic has really uh, come on strong uh, and won a lot of business as a result of healthcare reform. So they're also one of those companies we want to keep a close eye on uh, because of their growth rate that they're on. In addition, we have McKesson and also Siemens. So there's some very large uh, companies that play in this space, and the stakes are very high. Uh, implementations might be anywhere from 10 to 100 million, uh, depending on how many hospitals and facilities would be included in that particular spin. So an area that I would uh, tell you to pay uh, very close attention to if you were going to interface at all with hospitals, you'll need to know how to interface with these systems. Speaking of interfaces, there are a couple of different interface companies also that you should be familiar with. Uh, one of those is a company called Cbion uh, that was acquired by Sun Systems. And then another is Cloverleaf, uh, which was acquired by Quabotics. And last is InterSystems. So all of these companies have direct interfaces into these hospital software systems. But in addition, you'll hear another term, uh, HL7 or Health Level 7. This was an international consortium that was really designed and created to help manage the flow of this data from the EMRs to the EHRs all across the continuum. And so if today you need to get an address file, there is a standard for both demographics as well as clinical information that you can turn to. And those uh, standards are published on the web. So uh, if you go to hl7.org, you can get more information. At the end of our presentation, we do have a list of sources for you for all of our data today and so that you can do some additional research on your own behalf. If you're looking more at the health plan or the payer area, then some of the companies that you may want to keep a look at would be a company like Trizetto uh, that owns Facets. And so they have a very large market share in the health plan software. There are also companies that specialize just in physician offices. So companies like Allscripts, uh, Medical Manager, Athena Health uh, are making tremendous progress in that particular area. In terms of health information exchanges, there are uh, not as many companies, but a lot of new uh, exciting companies. One that's moved over from the hospital space into the HIE space is uh, Epic, in particular might be worth uh, keeping a track of. And then also Axolotl and ICA Informatics here in, in Nashville. These are companies that we feel like uh, really understand 
what the future vision of an HIE might look like, either on a regional or state uh, basis. Eventually, it would be great to think about a day where we have a national health exchange, where any of my records are portable for me, whether I'm traveling around the country, I'm in my hometown here in Nashville, or if I'm in Florida or California, I should be able to have access to my clinical records. That does not exist today, uh, but one of the things that, that we really need to work on is a healthcare community. So as you start thinking about transactions, the other thing that you want to be aware of is how data flows between these healthcare providers and from the insurance companies. So that process would be called claims. So I go into the hospital today for services, and I'm going to generate a claim that will then have to get sent to a payer, and then they will pay out that claim back to the hospital. And so this, this transaction engine is literally uh, going on every day, and uh, there are millions and millions of transactions that happen on that particular um, uh, area. There's a website that I would encourage you to go visit as well, and that's around uh, healthcare efficiency index. Uh, it was originally created by Indion, which is the largest provider in this uh, particular space of claims adjudication and authentication and um, checking eligibility and those types of services. And so in there, they estimate, I think, that there are approximately 25 billion transactions that happen on an annual basis. And today, uh, less than 50% of those are actually done electronically. And so we are still doing a tremendous amount of, of paper in the healthcare industry, uh, unfortunately for all of us. Uh, if we just cut that number down by half, uh, we might be able to save uh, anywhere from uh, four to 5,000 trees in the country in a particular year, uh, maybe higher. So that is uh, one thing that I would also um, challenge us all with is a way to improve the efficiency and the adherence to um, uh, electronic medical claims and move away from paper-based claims. So big opportunities in those particular areas. As we start to talk about how data flows in an EMR, we're going to have to talk about coding a little bit. When we talk about coding, it's important to understand there's sort of a hierarchy that exists in coding. We talked earlier about major diagnostic codes, or MDCs, and that is a very large grouping of about 26, 28 different categories that we're rolling up into major disease classifications. Underneath MDCs are DRGs. Uh, remember earlier we talked about the launch of DRGs in 1982. And those are diagnostic-related groupings. And what we'll have there is more finite, so it might be a knee joint replacement uh, that is underneath the orth orthopedic uh, area of major diagnostic codes. In order to get to DRGs, what you have to do before that is look at the International Classification of Diseases, or ICD-9. Uh, many of you are probably looking at healthcare reform today and know that we are going to move to ICD-10. And you might not think that that's a big deal unless you really understand what's going on underneath here. But in the world of ICD-9s, there are 10 to 12,000 codes that you have to be familiar with from both a diagnosis and procedure perspective. When we move to ICD-10s, that number escalates to about 80,000 codes. And the level of specificity is much greater. Now, the ICD-9s and ICD-10s, most hospital providers, physician providers around the world are already using ICD-10s. The United States is lagging in this particular area. So it should help us uh, get to a global marketplace for healthcare and classification of diseases. So that is one impetus for moving us there. However, uh, that's not the only reason. The other reason is to have more specificity so that from both a clinical and a financial perspective, we would know more about what's going on. 
I'm going to introduce another term to you called grouper. And what happens under a grouper is that you take a combination of diagnostic and procedural codes from the IC9s and you group those together and that's what becomes a DRG. And you might say, why is that important? Well, a DRG is how a health plan is going to pay a hospital for your hospital stay. So most uh, companies have worked out contractual arrangements so that if you have, let's say, DRG 292, heart failure and shock, I know I'm going to get paid six to $7,000 for that particular DRG. In order to get paid that, I have to have the combination correct in both the diagnosis and procedural level data that roll up into that DRG. And there are some uh, very uh, large successful companies uh, in this particular area, Thompson Healthcare, uh, 3M, First Data, quite a few companies that provide that specific software and that service. Uh, so if you're going to get into coding, those are some of the areas that you want to be familiar with. Uh, we also have some other clinical uh, terminology coding as well that, that speaks far more to what's actually being treated at the location. So first and foremost is HICPIX, which is a healthcare common procedural coding system that is largely used by CMS today. Underneath HICPIX is CPT-4, which has to be licensed from the AMA, and that is a clinical procedural terminology. And these codes are predominantly used at the physician office location and at outpatient centers. So probably some of you are already going, well, why are we using all these different coding methodologies? Why don't we use one? Well, for me, when I look at where healthcare is going, as we start talking about going from 2.7 trillion up to 4 trillion, 5 trillion dollars, this is one area that could be simplified and save a tremendous amount of money. So right now, you have to do a lot of crosswalks to go from CPTs to ICD-9 codes if you want to compare disease classifications from a physician office to an outpatient surgery center to a hospital location. And we haven't even gotten to wellness yet, but we will. Last but not least is SNOMED, one of the, one of the best uh, different types of um, processes for coding. And this is the systematized non-nomenclature of medicine. And this provides you with a really in-depth clinical view of the patient, not so much from a financial processing perspective. So this is another one of those areas that um, has continued to grow in its utilization, uh, especially around chart review whenever we're looking at specific patient indications. So that would be another area to really keep an eye on if you're looking to provide services into the hospital world. As we move out of uh, coding, one of the things that becomes very important is how do we measure quality in healthcare? Uh, there are some great services, even the federal government, that are pumping out more and more data and information about utilization. This is uh, from Hospital Compare, and I just went in this morning and took a quick snapshot of Baptist Hospital in Vanderbilt uh, to kind of see how they're doing on a variety of different uh, indicators. I do think that as consumers, uh, begin to take more risk for their own personal health care, uh, either through lack of employee-sponsored uh, plans or through a federal um, health plan that I, that I believe will occur, then it will become Im imperative for the consumer to understand where the best place to go for knee joint replacement or for respiratory and really understand from a disease perspective who is the best hospital what is the cost that I'm going to pay for that particular procedure? And we're, we're really just scratching the surface, but there are many, many different types of awards out there for clinical um, acknowledgement as well as the federal government sources. So another whole area that we could spend an entire podcast on learning more about quality. As we also think about uh, these quality measurements and some type of national plan that is uh, evolving as we speak. Uh, I thought it would be interesting to look at the United States from a slightly different perspective as far as uninsured are concerned. So we're close to 50 million uninsured today and that number is growing. Obviously one of the reasons that we've had health care reform is to make sure uh, that people can pay for the health care services that they need. 
But I looked at this a little differently, and I basically equated all of the population from all of the states in black to that 50 million. And so as a policy, if we said these states are not, and the residents of these states are not going to have access to insurance, that would never fly in this country. But it's basically what we've done with our policies. And so pretty dramatic look at what percentage of the country today is not represented in the insurance pool. Another thing we took a look at uh, is where Medicare spending is going. So uh, we do a lot of work around Geographical Information Systems, or GIS, uh, because we think it helps paint a much clearer picture of what's really going on. And in this particular um, uh, map, there's probably not many surprises as far as where total Medicare charges are occurring by zip code. Uh, we have a lot of concentration in the coastal areas, New Jersey, Florida, Texas, Arizona, and California. Uh, but what might be surprising is the opposite side of this, where we took a look at where average Medicare charges are by patient by zip code. So we thought that this would be a much tighter range. In fact, it's not. Uh, really, if you're going to go try to focus on just Medicare reform, we can begin in New Jersey and California, and those are the two most expensive states. And so um, that is where we would start. The least expensive state, for whatever crazy reason, is Puerto Rico uh, or, or territory. And that is also, for me, worth uh, looking at and researching more as to why they are able to deliver health care at a much lower price. Another area that's uh, pretty startling across the country as we start to think about health care and future health care demand is the area of obesity. In this particular case, uh, probably not surprising, is the far south, deep south, uh, leads the nation in terms of obesity. Uh, there are a couple of counties now that are close to 50% of the population is obese, and so those will be areas that we need to uh, really focus on uh, as we develop strategies. Unfortunately, a lot of times with statistics, only half of the story is being told here. So Colorado, in this particular case, looks extremely healthy from an obesity standpoint. But when we look at uh, where those trends are going, um, there are certain areas of Colorado that are having some of the highest growth rates in the country in terms of obesity. Now, all of the, all of the statistics majors in the, in the uh, room today will know why that is because their base is much lower at around 13% versus 48% in, um, in some of these counties in Alabama. But even some of these counties in Alabama have figured out how to slow down obesity, in some cases reverse the direction of obesity. A equally startling statistic to me is our country's 2020 health goal for obesity is 30%. So the ideal goal is for us to stay under 30% as a nation. Um, and many parts of the country are already well above that 30% and growing. So probably one of the number one areas. And what happens with obesity is it really manifests itself in a lot of other comorbidities around uh, diabetes, digestive disorders uh, as well that we talked about earlier in the disease profile section. Another way of looking at healthcare is through the use of psychographics. In the areas of consumer packaged goods like Procter & Gamble, they've been using psychographic profiling for a long time. And this is really looking at how households spend money. Uh, once again, we use a system from ESRI called Tapestry. And I'm able to look down into the block group level of a community and understand what kinds of people actually live there and what do they spend the money on. So once again, this is from our Orlando example that we were talking about earlier, but down here to the uh, south and east, I have a tremendous amount of household number 12, which are up-and-coming families. And so I'm able to now segment these up-and-coming families into uh, health care spending, whether or not they use emergency rooms, inpatient admissions, outpatient admissions, um, where do they work, uh, how do they spend their time after work. Uh, and so detailed information about individual household levels. I also believe that in order for us to attack healthcare costs, 
It has to be done both at an individual level by people taking more health care responsibility as well as a global community perspective. Uh, from understanding community health or public health, which we spend very little money, I don't know if anybody remembers our chart earlier in the presentation on national health expenditures, but very little is spent on public health uh, versus what we need to spend in this particular area. This particular ranking comes from the countyhealthrankings.org website, and this is a great way to look at your individual community as far as health factors and health outcomes. These make up the predominant number of areas that we have control over and can either change policy, attitudes or behavior, or clinical practices in order to make a difference. We took that data and information and stratified that over uh, Orange County in Florida, which is where Orlando is located. And so we can see over here that Seminole County is looking a lot healthier than Orange County. And if we were doing a contract for services in this particular area, we might want to adjust our risk profile up just a little bit because of some of the clinical uh, behaviors as well as uh, individual behaviors like drinking. They don't rank uh, as high uh, in certain areas. So those would be some of the ways to look at your community a little differently based on some of the information that's available today for healthcare that we didn't have even just a few years ago. As I was talking earlier about accountable care organizations, where that's really being driven from is within population health management. You have to understand what is going on in your communities and where you are most risk in taking care of those uh, community members. So in our model, we look at the total population, what that clinical health service demand is, whether or not there needs to be any risk adjustments for behavioral activities, and then we can come up with a total contract value for a community. That might be a county, it might be a city, it might be a state. Uh, all of these are going to be defined over the coming years and will really drive health care, I think, uh, into the future. In addition, one of the areas that you might also take a look at are individual carve-outs of the population. So a particular hospital or physician group might be extremely well-versed in cardiology or orthopedics, for example, example. And those are two of the clinical areas that really lend themselves to uh, doing a separate contract just for those services. And so we could look deeper into those particular areas and find out is hypertension higher in this community than another community and what the uh, exact risk adjustment should be. But we've created a little formula to help someone get from a huge amount of data about a community down into a per member per month type of ratio. One of the things uh, recently did was uh, created a dashboard for Orlando. So everything that you've seen in our presentation today is uh, now condensed into one two by three poster that somebody can have a complete understanding of where Orlando is today and where it's going. We think through the use of infographics that many people are able to help uh, paint a more accurate picture of what's going on in their local healthcare communities today than they've been able to in the, in the past. Another map I wanted to share with you are where some of these pilot ACO locations are. These were the original 32 that Todd Park and his group at CMS came up with. Uh, that program has been expanded and we'll be rolling out those. But just in these pilot 32 accountable care organizations, there are approximately 77 million lives that are underneath these areas. And so it represents a tremendous amount of uh, sandbox for us to play in as far as understanding how we could change a care delivery model in this country to either drive out more efficiencies, better quality of care, or even different outcomes as it relates to health care. So we're nearing the end, and I appreciate everybody's uh, patience and uh, really going through all these details. Uh, Carrie is doing an amazing job, which I'm going to flip over to in just a second and let everybody see uh, her doodle that she's done of the U.S. healthcare system. And like I said before, we will get that out to everybody that's on the uh, webcast today. But this is really where we see the future of healthcare going from where we are today in cost containment to really revenue enhancement. There's only so much you can squeeze. Uh, from within a particular organization. Uh, as we start to think about where future possibilities are, 
there will be a significant opportunity for both technology companies, but really clinical organizations who are trying to redefine how healthcare is delivered. Uh, we're going from expense management to expense management. This will always be a big concern for this industry. And uh, when you sell into healthcare, um, margins are typically very thin. I'll give you an example of California. There are approximately 75, 80 hospitals that are losing money today and another 75 or 80 that are right on the brink of losing money. So how that state is going to deal with 160 hospitals underwater uh, remains to be seen. But those are the kinds of trends that we need to be aware of that are happening in our local communities. In addition, today, commercial patients really represent the margin for the hospital. And that's why there's so much attention paid to this healthcare reform from both the hospital and physician perspective. And I believe that where we're headed is wellness will become the margin. So we will make money in healthcare based on taking care of our communities. And what that looks like is still yet to be defined, uh, but that is where we believe the world is headed. And then today is around uh, strategies for the plan. And we think the new skill set will really be about contract management. And those that execute on the strategy will really uh, reap the rewards of, of what's possible in healthcare today. So uh, as promised, I'm going to flip over and uh, share my screen again uh, where we can uh, look at our doodle. And then what I thought we would do is open it up uh, as well for Q&A and uh, be able to uh, answer any questions uh, that you have uh, have submitted to us. So uh, we appreciate that. So I'll turn this on at the same time. All right. And so here's uh, Carrie's doodle. Uh, I'm always constantly amazed by uh, the creative genius uh, that exists in the world and uh, being able to take a very complicated subject like Healthcare 101, Cradle to Grave, and pull it down. And as promised, I do want to give you some uh, grave statistics as well, uh, because I think that, um, you know, it's equally important to know what's going on in the, uh, the, uh, the last few days of our life. But uh, there are 2.4 million deaths per year. And uh, if you remember, we have about almost 4 million so that's why our population continues to grow. Uh, and life expectancy has now moved out to 78.5 years of age. The number one causes of death, as I said, are heart disease and cancer. Respiratory follows cancer, then stroke, then accidents, unintentional injuries. Alzheimer's is one of the fastest growing areas at now 79,000 deaths per year. Diabetes alone accounts for about 68,000. Influenza and pneumonia is next on the list. So um, whether we're talking about the first days or last days in healthcare, um, they can be uh, obviously most expensive that we have uh, while we're on Earth here. So uh, I don't think I had the video on, so let me pop that open again so that you can all see the healthcare 101 graphic. And as I mentioned, we will take a uh, high-quality picture of this and embed it onto the end of the presentation that we have. We are going to say a very big thank you to you for presenting a fascinating webcast for us all, for sharing your knowledge and expertise. Well, thank you. I've uh, enjoyed it quite a bit, and uh, we look forward to uh, comments. Uh, I think, as you mentioned, this will be available on the O'Reilly website uh, within about 48 hours. Again, we'll say a big thank you to Todd. We thank everyone that attended today's webcast and hope you benefited from it. This will conclude the event. Goodbye, everyone.